Today's lecture is an exciting next step in our quest to mathematically model football, and that's because we're going to start to use another type of data. Up to now, the data we've used has all been event data, is what happens on the ball. And of course, that's only a tiny part of football. There's only one player who has the ball at any one time, so there's 21 players who don't have the ball. And we also need to think about what they do when they don't have the ball. Football is everything about that tactical organisation which you have when you're not on the ball. And that is the data that we're going to look at today. The data is called tracking data, which tracks the movement of all of the players. There's various variations of this tracking data, but the idea is we're going to be able to track the movement of the players. So just to say a little bit about the different types of data that's available and where tracking data fills into this, let's look at the following figure that I got from Pascal Bauer, who works for the German Football Federation. So what we've looked at so far is event data, match events, passes, shots, goals. It's important to note that this is actually manually acquired. So there is a person there in the stadium who notes down when all of these passes occur and every event that occurs during the match. And so we have the shot, the player, and you're really, you should be pretty familiar with this kind of stuff by now. What we're going to move on to today is optical data or tracking data. Now this is the 2D positions of 22 players, so every one of the players. And we also want to have the 3D position of the ball. Now I, I do have to say that it's not always that we get precisely what we want here, right? So sometimes if we're, if we're collecting data from the television, for example, we're not going to have the positions of all 22 players. Because if you watch a match of football on the TV, it doesn't show all the 22 players uh, at once. But if, like the German Federation have, cameras in every ground tracking all the positions of the players, they can have this detailed positional uh, data of where the players are and also where the ball, are, ball is. Now there's one other type of data, and we're going to get to that later. We're not going to look at that in these two lectures, but there's one other type that needs to have a mention, and that is GPS data. And that is tracking data where you have a vest and you can have extremely accurate data of where the players in the team are. You set up G local GPS measurements and you can have very accurate centimetre accuracy uh, data of the position of the players. And you might ask a natural question. Oh yeah, and also you, have, you can have the heart rate and you can... Um, so, you, so you really have data about how, how hard the players are working and where they are. Now you might ask... Why don't we focus on this GPS data? Because it's the highest resolution and also it has this physiology data in, in built into it. Well, the problem is for any football club is that they only have the GPS tracking data for their own team. It's not that the opposition team will download their GPS tracking data with all the physical data of their players and supply it to their opposition. Not only would they not want to do that for... Um, uh, for competition reasons, it would also be illegal because they're sharing this personal data. So this data, the GPS data, tends to be only be available for the team that you're working with and not for all the teams. And that is why the optical tracking data is so important. So what does this look like in an ideal situation? Well, this is some data from Metrica. And if you look in the links on the web page for the course, you'll find um, some tools for plotting this created by Laurie Shaw, who's pictured down there in the right hand corner. Um, he worked with me when we made a lot of the Friends of Tracking videos originally, and then he got a job for Manchester City and is working there as their head of AI insights. So um, it certainly went well for him. But anyway, what he did is the first stage of plotting this Metrica data is plot exactly the positions of the 22 players. So now you can see precisely what I mean. Here are all the players in the teams, numbers of their jersey numbers, blue versus red, and black dot is where the ball is. Now on top of this, you can also look at the direction they're running. And so what Laurie has done here is he's added a vector pointing in the direction that each of the players is um, running. And the longer the vector, the faster they're running. This, I think, is the 
simplest and most immediate way to visualize this type of data. You get a feeling when we looked at the previous plot, it was very static, but suddenly you have a feeling for precisely how fast everything is happening. It's happening a bit faster over here, and it's happening a bit slower over here. These players are moving more slowly than those, these players are, uh, are moving. And now you can see actually that the blue team are in some sort of counter-attack situation. They've got the ball and there's one, two, three players immediately available in this counter-attack. So the vectors are very useful. This, this, this arrow is a vector. The vectors are very useful for showing how the game is moving. And then you can add to that, and this is done with this Metrica data, they have event data and tracking data together. So this is now an event data of where the pass is going to be made with the ball from this player overlaid on top of the tracking data. One question that comes up quite a lot about this is why can't you just use the, um, the ball position? Why do we even need event data when we have this? Well, it turns out that the ball is very, very difficult to track and there's quite a lot of inaccuracies in it. Another thing is it's very difficult to identify automatically when a pass has been made. So there have been some progress on this, on this type of question, but still in football analytics, we still need to have this type of event data which, um, which shows when, uh, where the pass was made from. So often we want to couple together event data and tracking data in order to get a full picture of what's going on. Okay, so let's look at a little video of this. Um, so, ball's being passed around, and you can also now see that the arrows are overlaid, so there isn't that much movement until the ball is run back by the blue team. There goes the pass. I can't remember if this is a goal or not. All oh, right, we're never gonna find out. You'll have to download the data and look at it for yourself to, to, to see if it's a goal or not. But you can now see that the blue team are in a good at counter-attacking situation after that particular move. Good, so a few limitations. I've mentioned some of these already. Um, doesn't account for your body position. So when we're looking at those direction arrows, I could actually be running backwards, for example, when it's done. And players do spend a lot of time backtracking, running backwards. Sometimes error prone, you can see ID switches in this data. The ball is usually, while we would want to track the ball in 3D, it's usually tracked in 2D, and that can lead to some very strange trajectories on the pitch. You still need to link it to event data. And also, there's these three matches from Metrica, but there's a lack of public data, I'm afraid, when it comes to this. And it's for several reasons. One of them is, I mentioned GDPR earlier, one of them is that it is personal data on the movement of football players. So companies are very reluctant to release that data. But within leagues, they have it. Um, so, they, so they have it within leagues, but they don't, they don't release it outwards. So I think that's one of the biggest reasons Maybe there's also an idea that um, they want clubs want to keep this data for themselves and do development on it before they release it to a wider, um, a wider public. So there's a lack of public data, I'm afraid, for this, these types of analyses. But the Metrica data that is available for the three matches and a few other bits and pieces of data, they actually allow you to learn and develop these methods. So you, you can definitely, definitely do some learning on this data it's just that we're not currently in a position where there's lots and lots of it available that you can get it for the last Premier League match and so on. Okay, so how are we going to analyze this? Well, the first method, and this is something that I wrote about um, in Soccermatics, is using something called Voronoi diagrams. And this goal in particular got me interested in how we can actually study the movement of football players. I'm going, to, I'm going to show it a couple of times here. But it's Lionel Messi, of course. Pass, bit of a dribble, pass again, and he's basically gone through the entire team and scored a goal. So this was the dream tiki-taka era of Barcelona football. And of course, Messi is the focus of this run, but there's also an interesting interplay with his teammates, with Xavi and Pedro in particular. Let's just watch one last time. So... Here goes Messi, one pass from Xavi, pass into Pedro, back to Messi, and then it's a goal. Now, the Voronoi diagram allows us to see how the players are controlling space. So what this diagram shows is all of the points that are closest to Messi, closest to Xavi, and closest to Iniesta. 
So inside this zone, you could call it, this line here, um, all of this area is closer to Messi. Inside this zone, every point is closer to Xavi. Inside this zone, every point is closer to Iniesta. Now, in this particular case, we haven't looked at the areas controlled by the opposition. We've said, what, how, do, how do Barcelona divide up the space between the players? But what's nice about the Voronoi diagram and makes it really related to football is the way it can be used to construct passing triangles. Now, we've already laid out our zones here for the Voronoi diagram. And now what we do is we take a line at a right angle to the dividing area of the zones and we draw that between the players. So here is the dividing line between the zones of Xavi and Messi. And we draw a line which is at a right angle to that between the two, and that tells us this passing poss possibility. Similarly, for Iniesta, we can draw a line like that, which is at a right angle here, and we have the uh, passing possibility. And what, what we take is we take and draw those lines for every one of these different zones between the players, and we create something which is called the Deloigny triangulation. And that triangulation shows us all of the passing possibilities of the player. And the lovely relationship here is that by opening up space, you also find what these passing triangles and alternatives are. So the better you control and open up space, the better your passing triangles are going to be. And this is nicely illustrated here, of course, and if we think back to the video example, Messi makes precisely that pass to Xavi, Xavi passes back to Messi, and then, just a few seconds later, we see precisely the same situation with Messi and Pedro. Pedro moves into an area where he leaves the opposition on the edges of the boundary. I forgot to mention that was exactly the same here. The opposition were on the boundary between Xavi and Messi. The opposition are now on the boundary between Pedro and Messi. He can make one more pass and the same thing happens. And so by continually opening up space, we can also see the way that Barcelona op open up passing triangles. You can have a look at this yourself. There's some code for making the Voronoi diagrams. Um, it really is just finding this sort of set of points which are nearest. You're, you will have to do, do your own thing if you want to do the Deloigny te tessellations. But there's some code there on the web page for making the Voronoi diagrams for, for different player movements. And this really opens up a new way, or it opens up a sort of first way of studying space and usage of space in football. And what I like about this story is because I, I, I did this study, one, it was one of the first things I ever did when I wrote the book Socomatics, is study Messi's opening up of space. And then a few years later, I had the opportunity to go down and study Messi firsthand. And I visited La Masia in um, Barcelona and um, had a look around there analysis um, complex and I met this guy here, Xavi Fernandez, and found that at Barcelona they were doing pretty much exactly the same research as, um, as was suggested by these Voronoi diagrams, but they come a little bit further. And Xavi was using something which um, he called pitch control. And the idea of pitch control is that you also take into account the vectors are where the players are moving. So my analysis of uh, Barcelona was a very static picture. We didn't, we didn't see who would get to the ball first because we didn't take into account the momentum of the players. Now what um, Xavier did is precisely that. So now you see the arrows indicating, the, the vectors indicating where the player is running. And what's shaded here in red is places where the opposition will get to the ball first. And in green is areas where Barcelona will get to the ball first. So you can think of it like this. If the ball was dropped down at random here, a yellow player would get to the ball first. If the ball was dropped down at random here, a Barcelona player would get to the ball first. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of Xavier's calculation, but I'll give you a rough idea of how it works. So when a player is stationary, as in this particular example, then he or she can move around anywhere and take the ball. So the assumption is that from a stationary position, you can equally quickly come to any position. 
When the player is moving, it's clear that they can come to places in front of them more quickly. So when they're moving forward, they can, of course, come to places in front of them more quickly than places behind them because they have to make a change of direction. And he modeled this basically using two normal distributions overlaid, one related to the vector of movement, one related to the current position. And this allowed him to make a model of player influence, who's going to manage to get to the ball first. And from there, so he had a kind of, this gave a, so here is a very high probability of coming to the ball, uh, very likely that you'll get to the ball. Here is a very low probability of getting to the ball in, in some sort of time frame. And by making these plots for every player and calculating the overlap of them, he could construct these types of surfaces, this pitch control surface, which shows which player is going to come to the ball first or which team is going to come to the ball first. Now, that is one way of doing it. And one thing that we're going to find with this pitch control is maybe a little bit like expected threat in this, in this sense. One thing we're going to find is that there's many different ways of calculating pitch control, or sometimes it's called past probability. So here, going back to Laurie's example, here was the situation where player 20 was about to pass the ball. And here is a calculation made by Laurie of which players control which areas of the pitch. Now again, you should go in and have a look at Laurie's video and his, um, his tutorial on all the stages to create this model. I'm just going to go through the, give you an overview and give you an idea of the, the key parts of, of the pitch control calculation he makes. So it's slightly different than Javier's calculation. Javier's calculation is it's more, it's just more based on the normal distribution and a kind of intuitive feeling about how you, how you come to the ball first. Laurie tries to calculate a bit more physics and you can put even more physics after that. But let's have a look at Laurie's method. So he builds a pitch control model on the following principles. He says, for any given location on the, on the pitch, how long will it take for the ball to arrive? How long will it take for each player to arrive? And then, what is the total probability that each team will control the ball after it has arrived? And he wants to repeat this calculation on all locations of the pitch. So here is the pass that we studied. This was the start position. And this is the end position of the pass. There's a few modeling assumptions put into this. Uh, you assume a ball speed, and that allows you to say an arrival time. So the arrival time of this particular pass is 1.4 seconds. Now, I, I, I like a lot of aspects of this approach because it's a very heuristic, physics-based approach. It's taking, and, and Laurie's a physicist, so it's really taking the ideas of ball flight in a rough heuristic way and calculating some things about it. Now you can make lots of improvements on this model, you can calculate all the physics of the ball flight or something like that, but at a very simple level you have a ball which is traveling at 15 meters per second and you have a, a time that that arrives and that's a good starting point for, for a model and it's pretty much all you need in order to get going with a pitch control model. Okay, so how does he um, calculate this? Well. Now, once, we, once we've uh, looked at the ball flight, we need to know, um, so the ball is going to go here, and we've got two players here who are going to run and see if they can get it. And then from there, um, Laurie calculates, well, how long it is they're going to get to it, and then he uses a, a function which takes the time to get it and converts it into a probability, and then he can work out the probability that one of these players will get to the ball before the other. And in this case, he's worked out that it will take 1.5 seconds for the blue player, 24, to get to the ball, and 2 seconds for the red player to get to the ball. Putting these both into his probability function, he gets this relationship between the two. Again, I want to emphasize the heuristic nature of this calculation. Now, from some basic thinking about players' change of direction and, and running, we can work out that it's likely to take two seconds for player four to get there because he's got to change direction, and 1.5 seconds for player 24 to get there because he's still running in the same direction as he was going before, and also he had a slightly higher velocity to start with. And from there, once we've got that, we need to put those two parameters into a 
model which calc calculates the probability that they'll control the ball. Now this again involves quite a lot of heuristic modeling and guesswork and trying to get it right and trying to think about the problem and then testing back against data. So there's quite a lot of steps and going through all of that, which is kind of hidden there when Laurie comes up with his final functions. But it's really about an honesty in your modeling, thinking about the physics, and then testing to see if it really um, agrees with reality. And this is the end product of this model. So in this case, I think the ball ends up around about here. So there's a slightly higher probability. I think it was 70% versus 30% that the, uh, the blue player will get it. White areas are 50-50 balls. Red areas are red team ball. Blue areas are blue team ball. You'll notice we use quite a lot of different color scales in this, but it's always the same idea that underlies it. Okay, so... What else can we do? Well, as I've said a few times, and I don't know if this is a discredit to uh, Laurie or a credit to Laurie, there's a lot of heuristic ideas in that. Now, there's a very nice video by Will Spearman, who now works for Liverpool. So it's interesting, Laurie's gone to Manchester City and uh, Will Spearman has uh, gone to work for Liverpool, um, where he develops more of these things. So you can have a look at that um, uh, you, you can have a look, I think, more yourself and, and spend some time studying this video where he goes through the steps that he used in order to cr create a pitch control model. He calls, he calls the first the, the basic model, which uh, Laurie outlines, the pitch control model. And then he looks at something called a dynamic pitch control model, which takes into more account of the time flight of the ball. So there's different variations of this model that you can create, which make different assumptions about the physics of the ball. I've also worked on one of these types of models. I worked uh, together with Frank Peralta, where we created um, a physics-based model of player motion, a little bit more details of the physics-based model of ball motion than, than was put into earlier models, and then tried to calculate the probability of interception for different parts of the pitch the same way. So that gave slightly different results. Um, it was much better, I think, for nearer short passes and then it gave around about the same results for longer distance passes. So again, lots of different ways of implementing this, and there is no absolute correct answer about how a pitch control or a pass probability model should look. Now let's get into the fun stuff, some of the example applications. Once, once we've got these pitch control models, it turns out there's loads and loads of things that we can do. So I'll start here. This is an example from when we were working with Hammerby with this. And I'll let you watch the, the shot first. This is Alex Kaczynicic. He, oh, he made a pass, and the pass doesn't come, come forward. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll put this on repeat for a few times so you can get a feeling for it. Now, something I want you to notice here. Okay. He makes a pass, it fails, but were there another alternative? So you'll see here um, that he actually had a player that he could pass to who was making a run here on the right hand, on the right wing. And now he's looking very upset that he doesn't get the ball. And so how can we study this? Well, what we can do is look at exactly this point. He has uh, two options. One is here central and then one is out on the wing where this player is running very fast. And here is now the situation using uh, Fran Peralta's pass probability model. And this is the actual pass that was played. Um, this is the uh, player who was in the forward position running, and this is the player who was running out on the wing. And you can see that the green area here shows that this was a high probability pass if he turned and passed it out to the wing. Um, number 20 is, is left-footed, so it was definitely a, a possible alternative but he chose to pass it centrally and ended up overweighting it um, towards the goalkeeper here. In the next lecture, I'm actually going to come back to whether this was the best choice, because even though this pass was the easiest to make, that it was most likely to be successful, it, 
might also be an idea to make this pass because as we've seen from expected threat, the pass to the center would be more valuable than the pass out there. So we, we haven't actually completely answered at this point whether he should have made the pass out to the wing or if he should make the pass centrally. But what we have done is we've established that the pass out to the wing had a much greater chance of success. And we can use these models in a variety of settings. This is one of my favorites that we worked with with Hammerby is that now we're being attacked. So Hammerby are the green team and we're being attacked by the blue team. The ball goes in and it's cleared and you see it bounces out of the box where it's collected up by us. And this is the player who made the interception, Moyo Tankovic. And that's going to become relevant here because now the ball's out to the wing again and it's actually Tankovic who scores the goal in the end. Um, and what I like about this is it shows both an, a defending principle around pitch control and an attacking principle around pitch control. So we'll look at this in now on a pitch control video. This is the attack against Hammerby. Ball comes out, Moyo picks it up. You see these green areas. These are opening up space by our players. This is a run out on the right wing, the left wing, centrally. <clears throat> the ball comes in and eventually it goes into the box and we score. And so this gives a very good bird's eye view of who's controlling which space during, during particular actions. And if we just take a few sti stills of this, we can see this is when the ball was cleared. Number 13 clears the ball. And we control quite a lot of area outside our penalty area. So you can think a, bit, a little bit like, it, like this, that the ball will be cleared in a kind of random direction. And if we control more area, then the ball is more likely to be cleared to one of our players. And that's exactly what happens here. By controlling this area, we make sure that when the ball comes out, we are, we are more likely to control it. And we want to control as much of our penalty area and the area outside it as possible. But then you can also think about the way that it opens up space. So this is a few seconds later when Mojo Tankovic is running with the, the ball and this is Kachanichis again who was in the first example. He's opening up a space on the right and we're also opening up a space on the left wing. So we can both see how we're controlling dangerous spaces and how we're opening up spaces afterwards. This is now using the, the past probability model. Here we just, uh, often we use the pitch control model, the pure, this is going back to um, Javier Fernandez's um, pitch control model. We often use that for things about where the ball is sort of bouncing around and is going to go in a random direction. The pass probability model is more used when we're making passes. But this is the pass, pass probability model and you can see that in this situation, there's maybe, I think it's a sort of 60% um, chance of succeeding with a pass into the middle, but there's a 98% chance of succeeding with a pass to the wing. And so um, Kachanichis makes the decision to pass to the wing. He could have also passed out to that wing, you see, which is also free. Maybe slightly offside, I'm not sure. But uh, definitely, definitely this is a safe pass. And then a few seconds later, we see the pass probability into the center here. Now this, of course, is a very high goal scoring opportunity, very high expected goals from there. But also there's another area open out there. And these is a 95% chance of a successful pass out there and a 65% chance of a pass to the middle. So very good chance either of those passes is going to either, yeah, one, one is a very good chance of, of being a goal if it's passed forward. The other one is pretty good chance of being a goal, but a very good chance of, of success of the particular pass. And these types of pitch control techniques can be used in so many different settings. So this is an example, again, from Hammerby. This is from Hammerby women's team. This is a defensive situation. The ball is now out here on the, the right wing. We've just lost the ball, and the risk here, here is a one-on-one -on -one situation with our defending player. What you can see from the pitch control picture is we've kind of overcommitted to the right wing. So when the opposition do win back the ball, 
we're not actually particularly marking this player and we don't cover enough space around here. And what we developed both with the men's team and the women's team is this idea of a defensive cross. So the managers of both teams were interested in, well, what happens? We want to play a very attacking football where we come up into the opposition's half and uh, maybe have five players attacking around the opposition's uh, box. Well, what should the other players do so that when, if we lose the ball, which we often do in any attacking situation, we don't get counterattacked. And one of the strategies we used is something we call the cross. The idea here on the, on the right, you see a kind of perfect situation. Here we have five attacking players. We have, um, we've got the ball down here. We've got three players in the, in the box. Maybe he could actually even move further in. But we have a defensive organization here where, which allows us to push forward, that we can have two players just outside the box, we control this area here. And this is an opposed to, so this is the ideal situation, as opposed to a not so ideal situation, where the ball is down here again, In both cases the ball is low down here. But here we really want player 11 to move into where six is, and so six can move to eight, and eight can move into there, so that eight is in a more attacking position. But because 11 is, is further out at the top there, there isn't the same possibility to move into this attacking formation. And so this is very, um, if you follow a lot of these football tactics, this is very connected to the idea that the um, fullbacks should play more centrally, that they should come into the half space, it's called, and play more centrally. And this is a way of using that to effectively defend when you're attacking. So that's it for today. We've introduced a new type of data in this lecture and we've already been able to get quite a lot out of that data. We've been able to study both tactical ideas, we've been able to study successful passing, um, when, when a pass opportunity is available or not, all using this model called pitch control or sometimes we call it pass probability. So there's a lot we can already get from that. In the next lecture, we'll take this idea of controlling space and we'll combine it with the idea that we've already looked at, which is the idea of expected threat. And that will allow us to find out not just if a, pos a pass is possible to be made, but also the value of that pass once it's made. But that'll be lecture seven. Come back for that. See you later.